You know, most of us can't imagine what it must be like to have $29 billion, which equals 128,955 crore rupees. If you try to count it at a rupee a second, day and night, it'll take you 900 years to get there. It's more than the combined wealth of the Tatars, the Ambani brothers, Birlas, Narayana Murthy, Godridge, Malias, and many others. And it's been achieved by my guest in just 16 years. How did an Indian boy, born in a small village, become the most powerful man in the steel business today? What did it take? And what is his story? It may be no coincidence that my guest's first name is that of the Hindu goddess of wealth and prosperity, Lakshmi Nivas Mittal. Just let your thoughts, your thoughts and, and dreams, dreams unfold and I Let's talk of love, talk of love to me I was privileged to have our rendezvous in London. In the Mithil residence. Kensington Palace Gardens. At 500 crores, it's the most expensive house in the world. It's a home where no cameras had ever entered before. It was a palace. Grand. Spectacular. With the bejeweled marble swimming pool and Turkish baths. Gilt ceilings. Picasso. And objects that would excite any collector. I was keen to meet the extraordinary owners for whom this is home. An Indian who has reached beyond our dreams to become the third richest man in the world. Lakshmi Nivas Mittal, it's a pleasure to be here. Pleasure is mine. Thank you so much for letting us into your world, beautiful world. <laughs> I'm very happy to see you here in London. Thank you. Normally you do all your shootings in Bombay or in your studio, but I'm very happy and very glad that uh, you took all the efforts and trouble to come to London to shoot me. It's our privilege. Thank you so much. I wanted to ask you, many elements go into the making of steel, don't they? Yes. There's uh, iron ore. You require a lot of uh, raw materials, a lot of uh, energies. There are many process of steel making. So in the same way, I want to know the process that went into making you the person you are today. <laughs> <laughs> so, created in, in Rajasthan. Yes, born in Rajasthan. I spent first five years of my life in Sadulpur. Rajasthan. Yes, Sadulpur. There was no electricity, there was no, there was no water, there was no proper home. It was like a village? It's a, still a, it's now it's a town, but at the time, sure, it was a village. And you remember much of it? I always remember difficult life in Rajasthan because there was no electricity. We would be shivering in the night, <laughs> hot condition, summer. So it was a difficult life in Rajasthan on those mm -hmm. days. 
So that makes you a little bit stronger. The hard times always make you stronger. Which is true. Mm -hmm. And that's why you see a lot of businessmen came from Rajasthan and very successful businessmen. Mm -hmm. So this is how is I grew up. Then you moved to, uh, to Kolkata at the age of six or five? Yeah, at the age of six. How was it growing up? We are a large joint family. I am the eldest of five. Was it a typical uh, middle class Marwari uh, household or was it a more cosmopolitan one? It was basically a middle class middle Marwari class. style. I went to a small school in the beginning, mm. like Patsala in okay. Calcutta. When you go back and think of Kolkata those days, what do you remember most? What pictures come to mind? My memory is that we used to live in a small flat near central Calcutta, just by the side of the tramway line. And every day morning, five o'clock, you would hear the tram passing by. <laughs> That's the memory which I have. Can you remember anything of your childhood that probably set the foundation for your late, later achievements? When you grow in a large family, you do not get uh, great attention from your parents. And that makes you more independent to begin with because parents have brothers to look after, or their parents to look after. So you start thinking by yourself, you should study hard and you should work hard, be independent. So that's, I think, is very important foundation for me. But uh, you were uh, an excellent student. Always topped the class, didn't you? Yes, I finished my higher secondary, I topped the school. But then that's a sign of, uh, of later achievements. Uh, yeah, I think uh, that was a good start. Were you uh, pressurized to get good grades or was this something you enjoyed doing? Yes, uh, my father and my mother would always look at that, that I topped the class. They would pressurize you? Yes, there would be always pressure, indirect pressure. I remember I would tell my father every day during exams how many hours I studied. Oh, you'd have to. He would ask me in the evening how many hours you studied after school. You don't like it though. <laughs> <laughs> you don't like it though, so much of pressure, but I think in hindsight it was the right thing to do. As a parent still I would do the mm -hmm. same for my children. I would expect them to excel in what they, were, mm -hmm. they are doing or what. You were studying in a Hindi medium school initially? Yes. And uh, was it difficult to make a transition to an, an English medium college? In the beginning, yes. In the beginning, yes. Must have been. Yeah, it was difficult to grasp what's going on in, what was going on in the class. Mm. I used to have a class where a lot of students coming from English medium. Yeah. There are very few coming from Hindi medium. Yeah. So you work harder because the challenge is different. Challenge is to first catch up where you are and where you need to be and then to excel. Is it true that the principal of Kolkata St. Xavier's was initially reluctant to admit you because you came from a Hindi medium school? You know a lot about me then. <laughs> yeah, it was difficult. I remember Father Joris, uh, he would not accept me. So it was my persistence and continuous following up with him. Finally, he accepted me. Very happy day for me mm -hmm. that I got into St. Javier's. It was the premium, premier college in Calcutta. And you topped that as well. You came first in, in college as well. Yeah, I got, uh, I, I got first position in commerce. Uh. <laughs> well, so the achievements actually began right from uh, your young days, if you really look at it. It's the challenge which makes you work harder. It's not. Uh, because when you have so many challenges, you get more determined. And then looking at parents, they have high aspirations. So all these things make you work harder. And I also used to attend my, uh, my father's office. So it at was the same time at the college. same time. I would go to college in the morning, Do 6 o'clock to 9.30 if I remember right. <laughs> yeah, then I would go to my father's office from 10.30, 11 till 5.36, then come home study. Was there any fun or freedom for you when growing up or was it just hard work? <laughs> I don't think we ever felt that there was no freedom or anything. 
I never felt that. Uh, Did that you know what was fun? No, I used to play football, cricket on Sundays. We were allowed to go movie once a week, if I remember right. Once a week? Yeah, with the whole family, we would go to movie. First of all, we come from a uh, medium class family. Mm. Then you are so much focused and committed to your work and to your education. As I was, I never thought of going out. So I went to a restaurant first time when I was 14 or 15. I remember in Park Street. Uh, uh, really? I think I went to Trinkers. Trinkers, Trink okay. First time in my life. That was a great uh, excitement. At that time when you joined your father's steel mill, you did it voluntarily or was it expected of you? I think it was combination of both. I also wanted to learn business quickly mm. and my father also wanted me to join. So I basically joined as a clerk, a purchasing clerk, reporting to a guy, I still remember his name, Chatterjee from <laughs> Calcutta Island. I used to work under him and in the evening after I finished my work, he would also give me a letter to go to go and post because on those days we didn't have the courier service. So you have to go and go to GPO and yeah. stand in the queue and give you a letter and get this. At that time, steel mills were going through a very difficult time. India wasn't offering much, was it, in the early 70s? Yeah, we had a lot of uh, license system. And it was difficult for private businessmen to grow. Mm. We, would have, we had a policy that everything should be under public sector. There was only sale and I think Tata Steel at that time. Yeah, sale used to be called Hindustan Steel, if I remember right. Ellen, were you ambitious? Because, you know, today lots of all these young boys growing up have clear life goals and a plan. Did you? I won't say that uh, I was that ambitious when I left India. My father and I have always been great friends. Uh, every day during lunch, we would sit together. He would tell me his feelings about India. We would discuss uh, how things should change. Mm -hmm. And I knew that he wanted to do something abroad. He bought a land in Indonesia and he saw the progress, not enough progress. He decided to sell the land. In Indonesia? I was going on holiday with my you were, friend. You were going on a holiday at the age of 25, for the first time you were going abroad. Yeah. And it's taken you 30 years. <laughs> you haven't come back since your holiday. <laughs> Is that right? But it's a very funny thing, what happened? Yeah, what happened? Uh, we decided to go to Bangkok, Singapore, Jakarta, Hong Kong and Tokyo, an excursion ticket. Uh, so my father said, when you are in Jakarta, at least go and sell this land. I went there and uh, tried to understand what was the problem. Coming from a business background, when you go to any place you want to know, how is this country, what's yeah. the future, how is the progress? Was, uh, was Indonesia at that time more progressive than India? Of course, it was a very growing economy. And it, they had no restrictions they like India? They had no restrictions. So did, when you arrived, did you smell the scent of success and opportunity? That's how the whole thing evolved. Okay. And I felt that it's a good place to do business. Fortunately. Uh, I could succeed in solving that particular problem about electricity. That was the main problem. So I called my father and I said, uh, I think we should go ahead with this project and I want to stay back. And we decided not to sell the land. And then you built a steel mill there? Yes. I got a lot of help from my father to get it done. And you stayed 14 years in, in Indonesia? Yeah, uh, that was a very interesting time because in, in India, competition was not there. So we are in a free world. What was the big leap in your fortune, in the Mittal fortune? It would be Trinidad, of course. Trinidad company used to be managed by a German group. The government was not happy managing with them. So we put in our proposal and that was a big, big move. Didn't you have to invest money in it? No, we didn't have enough money. So it took this company on lease come buy option. So I managed this company for five years and later on we did buy it. And soon after that, Mexico government approached you for, for their uh, steel mill because... Mexican government in 91 decided to privatize the steel industry and they, were, they went throughout the world 
talking to various companies who would be interested in participating in the privatization process. When they were talking to the Japanese, Japanese told them that only person, who private person who, who has worked on this technology is us. Yes. That is called direct reduced RN technology. DRI. That's how they approached us. And uh, soon after that, uh, Ellen, there was a split in the family um, division. Was this inevitable? It was inevitable because after, acquire, after working in Trinidad and Mexico, I realized that my future lies outside India. While my father and my brother wanted to expand in India. Of course, their point of view was also right because they foresaw the India much before others have seen it. Mm. Now India is a great place to invest. But 10 years back, perhaps people did not realize that India was a great mm. place to invest. And I thought that uh, there would be always a conflict in expansion. That's why we split in 94. early 94. But um, is, it, is it true that uh, you kept putting up proposals for acquisitions and the board kept rejecting them as too risky? The SPAT International Board did not want us to expand in the public limited company because they wanted us to focus on the existing businesses. Even for the Mexican deal, the board told you it's like jumping off the Howrah Bridge, don't no, take it I, No, no, it's not like this. I'll, I'll tell you the background. It was my family, my father who was, who did not want me to jump into Mexico. Okay. So he felt that if I venture into Mexico, it, is, it was like jumping from Howrah Bridge. Because it was a private company. Yeah. We became public in 97. So then after that, once you split, you applied the pattern of what happened in Trinidad and Mexico in various other countries in the world with your new acquisitions. After we acquired Trinidad and Mexico, I started thinking of growing globally. Yes. We acquired a company in Canada. Same year, we acquired a company in Germany. Germany. In October, we had an opportunity in Kazakhstan. Uh, but, uh, yeah. Ellen, there must have been a lot of competition. Why did you succeed over the others? Why did we succeed? <laughs> we have a uh, great team. Without the team, you cannot work. You also moved very fast with your deals. We have. <laughs> Quick decisions. It's funny. Uh, I remember two things, two contracts which we, which we wrote on the napkin. We had a joint venture in Mexico. We were having discussion with a potential partner and we agreed a few terms. So I said, why don't we just write what we have discussed? None of us was carrying paper, so we just had a paper napkin and we wrote down those conditions. That became the basis for that joint venture. Once I was having a lunch with a very important customer of ours in Switzerland. I didn't want to leave this lunch without taking this order and getting his commitment. So we just picked up the napkin, napkin again. Napkin again. <laughs> <laughs> and my sales director used to keep this napkin till he passed away. Because I gave this paper to him and said, this is a contract, now you start working. <laughs> so it goes back to my earlier days. I was in uh, Tokyo with uh, one of the businessmen from India. And when I was talking to him, I realized that acquisition is a way to grow. Mm. I realized that life is very short. Mm. And if you have to really do something, you have to do very quickly. If you have to grow, you have to do something differently than what everyone else has been doing. So I started thinking that if I start building a steel plant, it would take years. And how many steel plants, how can many you companies build? you can build? And if I have to succeed in my life, I have to find a formula which is different and which keeps me ahead of my competition and my colleagues. That's how I thought that we should acquire companies, merge, consolidate them, reduce their cost, make them very efficient. And it became like a, a Turnaround became a science. 
I, I would say that, uh, yeah, uh, it's not a, but it's science or art, it is a mix of uh, science mm. and art. Mm. Because every company has a different issue. It's not that uh, there is a formula which you apply. Can apply on everyone. Yeah, it is not as to is equal to water here. But the pattern, you established this pattern and yeah. you applied it in different countries, different markets. Yes. And that was the genesis of your empire. Yes. Today you have created the largest steel company in the world. I mean, your empire stretches from Kazakhstan to Trinidad, Germany, Canada, Poland to South Africa, four continents. And US. And US. It truly is an empire. How do you make your empire work? It's like running any multinational company. We have chief executive in every company with their own board of directors. I must say that uh, all my CEOs are entrepreneurs. I always tell them, in your company, you are Lakshmi Mittal. All right. I trust them and they decide uh, as if uh, they are Lakshmi Mittal. So they have all the trust, confidence and authority to act. And uh, I'm also flanked by my son, Adit. He's a remarkable boy. I would say kind of genius in his work at this age. And I got a lot of support from him in my business. And it really accelerated the whole process. Ellen, are you an easy man to work with? Yeah, I suppose so. Uh, I like to work with people. I like to work with different nationalities. I have 45 nationalities in my group. What quality do you look for from the person you want to employ? Can we trust each other? What value he brings to us? Will he be hardworking? But tell me something. You've taken huge risks, things that nobody would ever touch. Are your decisions based on logic or also instinct? First of all, uh, we have not taken huge risk. We take calculated risk. Okay. <laughs> we do not take any company, any underperforming company, which does not make money or does not make profit on the day of takeover. Our business plan must say that these companies would make profit within the first month. And definitely your intuition is very important based on your experience, based on your strategy. Have there been failures? Yes, there has been failure. There are two kinds of failures. One, deferred success. Okay which means what we plan, we are not achieving right. tomorrow, we are achieving maybe day after tomorrow, after three days. Mm. That is deferred success. Mm -hmm. That is one failure. <laughs> Second, uh, we acquired a company and we could not turn it around. It's a small business, but still it was a failure. One. One in Ireland. Ireland. So this always reminds you that uh, we should be careful. But when we close this company, we fulfill all our obligations towards the employees. So why wouldn't yeah. it work in Ireland? It was such a small company mm. and with so many restrictions in terms of production and product mix. We tried our best, we could not succeed. So we closed it. So when something doesn't shape up exactly the way you want it to, what do you tell yourself? Move on to the next. <laughs> <laughs> Is that right? You can just put it behind you? Yeah. You appear very unruffled, always. Whenever I've seen you, you're always smiling. You don't look as if you carry the burden of so many steel mills or anything on your shoulders. Do you ever stress? I have uh, 220,000 employees to share my burden. Why I should be the only person. So you don't stress or worry? No, you can't say that I don't stress or worry. Uh, but I'm a very calm person. I don't get agitated or irritated. I see every problem as a challenge and we need to address those challenges. Does anything keep you uh, awake at night? No, I sleep very well. Bill Gates was saying that he considers failure on a regular sort of a basis. Do you ever feel paranoia? No. I, sometimes I fear of uh, 
unknown. Something which we have not envisaged or which could come on us. That is the fear sometimes bothers me that have I, have we excluded anything in our business plan or are we not thinking something which we should think? Are we losing focus? But this, does this cause you stress? No, this keeps me alert. Okay. This really keeps me alert. Tell me, uh, do you believe in astrology? No, I don't believe in astrology. Definitely I believe in God. That there is some superpower which we don't know, we have not seen. You can feel sometimes that uh, something extraordinary person or someone is helping you. You feel there is an extra power helping you? Sometimes you feel in, I don't know whether it's a luck or it's a blessing of parents or bless, God's blessing, I don't know. But sometimes I do feel that in difficult situations, sometimes if we succeed and we start analyzing that. How did it happen? How did it happen? Was it because of our only efforts or something helped yeah. us to happen? And that's where I feel that there is some supernatural power in the world which helps you. Mm. And if you are very determined, very focused, very committed, I think it helps you more. You help yourself then, yes, true. But you've never gone in for all these astrological predictions? No. <laughs> Interesting. I never read them also. I used to do it when I was young, I must confess. For the last 15, 20 years, 15 years, I don't remember having consulted anyone or talked to anyone on these issues. I never bothered to really read those predictions. Forbes announced last year that you're the third richest man in the world after Bill Gates and Warren Buffett. I want to know what that meant to you. It really means uh, nothing much. How can you say that? As a person, I have not changed. I continue to work the same way. What changes? Nothing. It's an achievement. You've reached somewhere and it's been acknowledged by the world. You're an Indian. Yes, I'm Indian. I'm very proud to be Indian. But what changes? Uh, no. I don't feel much change except that people always keep me, keeps me reminding that you are the third richest or whatever, but it has not changed me yet. Now you've just gone ahead and you're buying Arsler, which is, after Mithil Steel, the second largest steel company in the world. This is an unusual move for anybody who's been studying the way your empire has grown. Because normally you have always gone in for acquisitions that were compliant, compliant assets. This is the first time you're taking on a politically sophisticated competitor. We have always believed in consolidation of the steel industry. And uh, these two companies are complementary to each other. Mm. Since we announced this transaction, we have, I have been encouraged by the reaction from the steel community. Mm. All the steel stocks have gone up. Oh, definitely. It demonstrates that yes. this is the right to move forward. You've said there's more to come. No, what I'm saying that uh, when we will complete this transaction, this will encourage other steel companies to also move towards consolidation. Consolidation or uh, will it be a monopoly eventually? No. No, consolidation does not mean monopoly. Creating a stronger steel companies which can show to their, client, their customers that they have a better future. There are business pundits who are trying to fathom the scale of your ambitions to know where all you are planning to head. We will really like to focus in China and India. But you're already in China. China, we have a joint venture which is uh, not Hunan. enough. Which yeah. is not enough. India is also very important. Is there anything in India that's big enough for you? In India, we have just announced a greenfield project. It'll have to be greenfield because what is there already? Sale is now very small. It's small change for you, isn't it? <laughs> no, no. Sale is very important. 
uh, it is a state run company, whenever sale will be, the government of India will announce privatization of the sale, mm. we would be interested. But it is important that companies like sale need a strategic global partner. Mm. So that also they get exposed to what is happening mm. in the world. Tell me Lakshmi, will you ever say, now my empire is done, I do not want to expand it anymore. Will there be such a time? You see, it is a world class institution, that is what we want to do it. And there is never a stoppage because if I am tired or and retired, then my son, son will continue. So this is a dynamic process which never gets stopped in institution. It is institution for generations to come. Limitless. I really want to know, what does money mean to you? I have very limited expenses, so beyond that it means nothing. Is it a number or, or security or is it power? It is the satisfaction of doing something different and unique, which is more important than but can one be called successful without money? Yes, there are a lot of uh, successful leaders in the world. They never look, they never earn money, but they have been the most successful political leaders. They have been most successful professionals. No, but when you're in business, business means money, barter, trade. Then money plays an important part. Can one ever be considered a success without money? Obviously not. In business also, there are a lot of successful CEOs. They may not be billionaire, but they have been very successful and I highly respect them and they are very respected globally. Okay. It is not that money makes you successful, it is the success which makes you happy. Do you know on any given day how much you are worth? <laughs> I never even thought about this and it, this has never occurred to me. I mean to look at my worth and I keep on reading in the media what they say. I was hoping you'd tell me that in this one hour that while we've been talking, how much has Mithil Steel made? I don't know the last stock price. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I really, maybe I, your son would have told me. <laughs> no, uh, I can do a quick calculation and tell you but I don't think it's it means uh, much to your listeners and mm. much to your audience. Why do you still hold an Indian passport? I love my country and uh, I'm Indian. Would your business have been easier if you'd had a European passport? I don't think so. It doesn't make difference. Now the world is uh, very global and. Uh, it doesn't make difference whether you have Indian passport or you have British passport or you have American passport. Is it some kind of an umbilical cord you have with India, this passport? No, I feel very happy and proud to have this passport and my allegiance is to India. Would you have been able to achieve all this if you'd continue to live in India? Truly? Uh, Perhaps it would have been, it would be difficult to be honest because very quickly at the age of 25, I got exposure to the world and this helped me to think globally. Now I see my, all of my Indian businessmen, businessmen wants to go abroad. They want to be global and this gives me a lot of happiness that at least uh, we led the process and mm. everyone sees the value in doing that. So if you were 25 today, would you have to leave India to become a Lakshmi Mittal? No. If I would be 25 today, I don't have, wouldn't have to leave India. Things have changed. Now, government policies are very positive. They encourage businessmen to go abroad, acquire foreign companies. Things have changed. Now, Have they changed enough to lure you back at all? I think so. I think so. If someone has to start his career at the age of 25 now in India and if he wants to be a global leader, he has much more access and opportunities than I had. Because when I started, 
we had so much of restriction in India and uh, it would have been very, very difficult to grow globally if you... And today could he at the same speed? It depends on individual. But take an individual like you starting off today at the age of 25, could you do it all over again starting today in India? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know whether we will have this, whether I will have the same opportunities and uh, I don't know. Is there anything that you would like to see changed in Indian policy? Speed and execution. Too slow? I think it's uh, taking time for everyone to understand the world has changed. We have to move very fast. It's, it's better of understanding mm. the dynamics. It's taking time to realize that others are taking over us. It's like we are on the highway, whether you are on the left side or you're on the center or you're on the right side. So you have to look uh, who is moving fast and you have to catch up. Yeah. I think we are progressing. The question is, can we do better? Your, your story, uh, Lakshmi, is not just a great success story. It's, but the way I look at it, it's really historic. I mean, here is a, it's a boy born in a small, poor Indian village without electricity and then he reaches here. You know, it's beyond inspirational, it's iconic. And a lot of people, a lot of young people in India want to know what it takes. What can you tell the ordinary Indian so that it could help him to, to try and emulate or, or duplicate your success? About 10 years back, a journalist asked me a question. At the time, my son was in college and this person asked me a question when your son comes back from the university would you follow your footsteps would you follow your advice I said to this person that when he comes back I want to follow him hmm. because he is the future he is the new generation hmm. he comes back with a lot of new knowledge new ideas, mm. with a new vision. And this is what I look at India. We have so many young children, young people. They are the future for the country. But they want to be Lakshmi Mittal. They will have all the opportunities because they come out with a new knowledge. Now a kid of seven year old, six year old can operate computers. He knows what's happening in Timbuktu or what's happening in Japan or United States, anywhere in the world. So there is so much of knowledge available today on instantly. And knowledge is the key. If you have the knowledge, if you have ambition, if you are determined, if you are focused, if you are committed, mm -hmm. use this knowledge to grow. Mm -hmm. Everyone can do it. And this is what uh, I would like to say to all young men in India. You're their hero. I wish I were the hero. Hero are all Bollywood people. <laughs> <laughs> no, truly you are. I'm still learning. I think uh, your success story is incomplete without your co-pioneer, your wife, Usha. My wife used to work with me till 97. Mm. Uh, she has a great understanding of what I've been doing. In difficult times, I always got a lot of support from her lot of advice from her. I remember when, uh, when someone came and conveyed my family's view on Mexico, that it's like uh, jumping from Havara Breeze. I had my son sitting with me and I remember my daughter was very young and my wife. I told my wife on that day, I remember that I realized that this was a this is the biggest risk of my life. Either this can take us to a different level mm. or it could really bring us down. Mm. And my wife said, uh, she calls me Nivas and she said, Nivas, I trust your decision. You just go ahead. That was a very important moment of my life to take such a big decision to acquire Mexico. 
that's where the family value comes in. Uh, everyone was against and if your family is not supporting you mm. on such an important moment. You can't do it alone. You can't move far, forward. What percentage of success, of your success, do you give her? When I got engaged with my wife, we didn't have communication facility. And I remember writing her my first letter and I said, I still remember that I welcome you as my life partner. So it's a joint role and it's very difficult to say percentage, it's a, such an integrated joint role. I understand. She would give me 100%, I would give her 100%. This is how it works. How sweet. Who is this woman Lakshmi Mittal shares his success with? She was 19, he 21 when they married. And through the years, she's been his inspiration, his advisor, his homemaker, and his one great enduring love.